All right, well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for coming out to listen to me talk about, uh, essentially talk about myself. <laughs> so um, I started at UCSD 12 months ago, or 13 months ago, um, in the School of Pharmacy. So um, I've had the opportunity to get a couple of projects initiated with some of the folks here at the ABRC. So I wrote a grant with um, Sheldon Morris, and that we got a notice of funding last week, so that's very exciting. And then um, Dr. Blumenthal and I submitted companion grants to Gilead last week, and hopefully we'll find out um, the outcome of those um, sometime in December. But uh, when Dr. Blumenthal, oh, there she is. <laughs> when Dr. Blumenthal had asked me to give this talk last week, um, one, of the, one of the things that um, we had done is come up with this title. And you know, in hindsight, you know, using the word pharmacokinetics, you know, it has a very specific connotation. Um, and it really is just a, a really fancy way of saying how much drug is inside of you, where does it go inside of you, and how does it get out of you? And, you know, so I'll tell you about my background. Um, so I have a degree in pharmacy, but also a degree in epidemiology. And I think there are three things that epidemiologists care about. And the questions we ask are, what is the exposure? What is the outcome? and what are the confounders, and defining drug exposure. Pharmacokinetics is a very, very specific way of defining drug exposure, but we know from the literature that you can define drug exposure in ways that don't involve an in vivo measurement um, of drug exposure. So you'll hear me, instead of using the word pharmacokinetics, I'll use the term exposure, and I think exposures are only meaningful when they're tied to an outcome. So what is the drug exposure associated with an out, you know, any type of outcome, whether it be achieving an undetectable viral load, toxicity, a change in renal function. So I'll talk about the exposure outcome relationships throughout my talk. And I think that's a long-winded way of justifying this title. <laughs> um, so in, dis in terms of disclosures, I have a Merck grant looking at C. difficile stuff and a Gilead uh, microelimination grant looking at uh, hep C elimination in co-infected veterans, which I'll talk about um, towards the second half of the presentation. So what do I wanna do today? Um, I wanna certainly introduce myself to the AVRC community and um, coming from an academic institu institution with less than 100 employees to a place like UCSD, which is pretty much the size of a city, um, it's hard to know who the key players are. Um, so I think I'm re reverse engineering things here and you know, I'll introduce myself and maybe the key players will come, come to me. <laughs> um, I also want to showcase some of my research interests and some of the projects I've done. Um, and I'm hoping that through that process, I'll illuminate kind of my skill set and what I hope to do. And I think also to showcase some of the soft skills that you can't really quantify. So hopefully um, you'll see my hustle and you'll see my ability to, um, so I gotta be careful with my New York bravado, but hopefully you'll see my ability to turn chicken toenails into chicken cordon bleu. <laughs> and then um, I'll talk about the projects I've initiated here at UCSD. Um, so I am a pharmacist by training, and I received, can they see me doing the mouse stuff? Okay. Um, so I'm a pharmacist by training, and I received my degree from the Albany College of Pharmacy, and you'll see that I had this Albany ankle bracelet on for a really long time, and I just kept going back there. Um, I left for a year to do a residency at the University of Toronto and, and McGill, and unfortunately, Neve, the pharmacist uh, here at the AVRC with uh, Letty, isn't here, but she was one of my residency preceptors on my therapeutic drug monitoring rotation at McGill. And, you know, I owe her a debt of gratitude because she connected with me with a lot of people here at the ABRC. Um, I returned to Albany to do a fellowship in ID outcomes research, but ended up doing a lot of PKPD modeling um, of different antibiotics and a, a variety of phase four um, post-marketing surveillance studies. Concurrent to my uh, fellowship training and the early part of my academic career, I got a PhD in epidemiology. Um, so that's why I'm so fixated on exposure outcome relationships rather than using the buzzwords pharmacokinetics. Um, and I uh, rolled into a faculty position in Albany um, and had a clinical practice site at the VA there. And I think one of the reasons why I took the job here in San Diego was, you know, when you're on service 24 to 36 weeks a year in these six-week blocks, 
it is very difficult to be productive and be impactful. Um, but I got a lot of clinical exposure in antibiotic stewardship, vancomycin and aminoglycoside PK monitoring, ID consult. And one of the fascinating things, one of the great things about the VA is pharmacists have the ability to get an advanced scope of practice. And that's what I did. I did uh, and that allowed me to write my own orders and write my own order, order my own labs. And uh, a nurse practitioner and I started a co-infection clinic. So we got our patients ready. We got them sober enough or sober enough to get el be eligible for receiving DAAs, follow them entire throughout their therapy, and did the SVR visit. And the only time we really needed to um, bug the doctors was the two cases where we had an autoimmune hepatitis. Um, so it was a really meaningful and really impactful time, um, especially given like the explosion of DAAs that had uh, become available at that time. But Last year, I took a job at Skaggs. I am still on the hunt for a clinical practice site. So if anyone knows anyone that needs someone 15% of the time in any of these areas, let me know. Um, uh, so hopefully I'll have a practice site in, in the new year. But today, I wanna talk about my scholarly interests. I went through my soapbox about exposure outcome relationships. I also have an interest in big data. We are surrounded by data and oftentimes we're doing nothing with it. Um, so I think it's a, a lost opportunity, and I'm going to present a lot of data on retrospective chart review studies, and I have that t-shirt. I ran it, run it through the spin cycle and wore it 10 times over. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like I have to just give this disclaimer that association is not causation, and I'm the first one to acknowledge that. But in terms of my approach to research, I, I think as an academic, we certainly don't go into academia uh, for the money. We certainly go into academia because of the, uh, the autonomy and the freedom that the job gives us. And for me, research is a form of artistic expression. Um, but in order to be successful in research, I think you have to treat it like a business. Um, if you, and as an academic, you get pulled in so many different directions. So if you ignore a business for three months to go on service, to go teach, to go serve on 20 different committees, that business is likely to fall apart. Um, I think of it more like that Tamagotchi doll from the 90s. You got to keep it alive. So you got to keep cultivating your research program um, in order for it to stay afloat and keep that train moving forward. And when you treat it like a business, your research program, you, you end up developing this entrepreneurial spirit and you learn how to be a boss. Um, you learn how to take calculated risks. Am I going to invest all of my time writing the most elegant grant that has a less than 1% probability of getting funded? Or am I going to invest my time in a grant that will keep all of my staff employed and keep that ship moving? Um, but ultimately, you need to have a lot of focus, drive, and determination. Um, does anyone here watch The Real Housewives of New York? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So Jill knows that Bethany on TV is an absolute lunatic and um, can act pretty crazy. But outside of the show, she is, you know, she's very, very um, entrepreneurial. And she has really cultivated that spirit of being a boss, taking calculated risk and taking very a deliberate approach to her business and, you know, has a, a multi hundred dollar, hundred million dollar business. Um, and I think it's because she is focused, she is driven, and she has a lot of determination. So that's kind of, Bethany is my spirit animal here. <laughs> um, so like any business, you should have a mission statement. And as quirky as mine is, um, mine's really to expand our understanding of antimicrobial exposure outcome relationships. Um, and I use the term antimicrobial, antimicrobial here because I, I do straddle the line. I keep one foot in the general ID door. And I think that's important. Um, and if you think about this as a business, you, you know, when, when funding is hot in HIV, it may not be in general ID. And when funding is hot in general ID, it may not be in HIV. So it's good to kind of diversify what you're doing. So this, this audience is certainly no stranger to the DHHS guidelines and the, what the panel defines as a, as a typical ART regimen. Um, so the DHHS panel recommend, uh, generally uh, recommends that an ART regimen consists of two NRTIs plus either a integrase inhibitor, a protease inhibitor, or a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. And collectively, I mean, I think this is really interesting because 
many, not all, of these medications are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 isoenzyme system, which is also responsible for the metabolism of several other drug classes. And when you think about a population of, um, I want this thing to stay closer to my mouth. And when you think about a population of HIV infected individuals who um, are, are aging, and as you age, you develop these age related comorbidities, and many of those age related comorbidities require medication therapy management, you run the risk of something called polypharmacy. So you're using multiple medications simultaneously. And that's associated with a high probability of adverse drug reactions. And adverse drug reactions, many of them are preventable drug-drug interactions and a huge contributor to ER visits and hospitalizations. On the inpatient side, drug interactions can be observed in up to a third of patients. And you think that's kind of scary because on the inpatient side, there's a high intensity of, uh, of oversight and a high intensity of care. Um, and the cost associated with mitigating those interactions is not cheap. Um, HIV is more of an ambulatory care type of condition. So on the outpatient side, where patients are being seen not only by their HIV provider, but seen by multiple providers who are providing medications um, to them, it, 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 may be, it may be the perfect storm where drug interactions are actually happening more ubiquitously and are underappreciated. Um, but ultimately, why we should care about drug interactions is they can result in patient harm. So we have three different ART regimen types, non-nukes, integrases, and proteases. And for the most part, I, I mean, there are some subtle differences between them. Um, they're all once a day. The, the contemporary regimens are fairly well tolerated. If you take them the way that they're supposed to be taken, they generally work. If you take them the way they're supposed to be taken, they generally have a low probability of resistance. And I think we're well beyond the days of using duplicative combinations like AZT and D4T or DDI and tenofovir. Um, so one distinguishing factor of the, uh, of the different ART regimen types are, are drug interactions. So um, this is a study I did with one of my, my friends at the University of New Mexico, just quantifying the frequency of drug interactions between the different regimen types. Um, and Somehow, you know, uh, we were able to secure some funding from Merck to, uh, to pay for the study. And that's really what we want to do. Compare the frequency of clinically significant drug interactions between the different regimens and um, our population were patients uh, that were receiving care in the upstate New York uh, VA, as well as um, patients that were receiving care in Bernadette's clinic, the University of New Mexico Truman Clinic. Um, so we collected a lot, of uh, a lot of data from the patient's medical records, but the thing that's probably the most pertinent is the medication list to determine what the exposure type is. So are they on an INSTE, are they on a PI, or are they on um, a non-nuke containing regimen? And our outcome was the, the, uh, the occurrence of clinically significant drug-drug interactions. And when defining an outcome, you want to pick an outcome that's easily reproducible and objective. So we use an online interaction checker that most pharmacists would use, LexiComp, um, to define our, our drug interactions. And, you know, unsurprisingly, uh, the PIs were associated with the highest prevalence of contraindicated drug interactions, followed by the integrase inhibitors, which in and of, in and of themselves, there's a lot of heterogeneity within the INSTE class. Um, so reltegravir is fairly benign in terms of interactions, um, but you have on the other end, elvitegravir, which requi requires a cytochrome P450 booster to um, have concentrations high enough to exert an antiretroviral effect. And then the lowest was observed in um, patients on non-nuke regimens. So it's, it's one thing to say that there are all these drug interactions that are happening, but I think you have to tie it to an outcome and you have to tie it to an outcome that means something to people. Drug interactions, unfortunately, there's so many different effects that they can cause. So some drug interactions can cause QT prolongation. Some drug interactions can cause hepatotoxicity. Some drug interactions can lower the seizure threshold of medications. So you have a lot of different types of effects and trying to study those effects becomes very problematic. But I think one common theme, if drug interactions are severe enough, one, one common theme that they may lead to are hospitalizations. So um, we, took, we took the patients that were in this initial analysis and looked to see, you know, upon starting these different regimen types, those with an interaction 
versus those without an interaction, are they more likely to be hospitalized? And what we found was there was indeed a relationship between having in, an interaction present at baseline um, and the, the, uh, the risk of hospitalization in the one year period following. So while I get there are a lot of things that go into being hospitalized, I think there's some signaling going on here and um, certainly, certainly an opportunity to say, hey, to the pharmacist, uh, maybe we can try to mitigate some of these interactions and maybe we can impact or make a small dent in um, the proportion of patients that are being hospitalized. Around the same time, um, there was an explosion in the number of drugs being available, becoming commercially available for chronic hep C. And um, I used my, my, my drug interaction stuff to turn those chicken nails into chicken soup um, and approach Vertex about quantifying the prevalence and predictors of drug interactions if you were to add those med add the telepravir containing regimen which is the product they had marketed to the medication profiles of patients with HIV and hepatitis C um, and also to determine the clinical predictors associated with contraindicated interactions so very very simple study to do didn't actually require patients to um, receive uh, telepravir containing therapy all we needed were the medication lists from our co-infected patients at the VA we took that medication list ran it through an interaction checker quantified the frequency of interactions and then hypothetically added telepravir to that medication list with peg riba because that was the entire regimen and quantified the excess frequency of interactions that would have been observed. Um, and, you know, a very straightforward study to do with very little resources. And um, what we found was before the addition of telep telepravir containing therapy, roughly one in five patients were walking around with an interaction. And then after the addition of telepravir containing therapy, that, that rate essentially doubles, which kind of helps you plan your resources. If you're going to, um, uh, dis dispense hep C therapy in in on mass to your population. This is probably where you have to also invest in a little bit of pharmacist time to mitigate those interactions. Thinking about the interactions that only involved um, ART medications, we saw a quadrupling of effect, um, and the predictors of those interactions were the use of PI ART, um, polypharmacy, and dyslipidemia. So at the same time, I thought, okay, this was a fairly straightforward study to do for, with very few resources. Um, and to have some balance in the literature, I, I replicated the study with bosepravir um, and essentially found a very similar finding that after addition of bosepravir, you see a dramatic spike in the probability of contraindicated interactions. And they're predicted by a variety of different PIs, efavirenz, and polypharmacy. Um, so the hep C guidelines kept evolving, so I had to keep doing these studies over and over and over again. Um, and this is the one that I actually got my PhD off of. But so in epidemiology, I think, well, let me back up. In pharmacy school, which I did first, um, the, and I think in medical school they do this too, the ideal study design is taught to you and it's ingrained in your head that it's the randomized trial. But in epidemiology, in uh, I think on the first day of epi, when you take the lecture on causality, the ideal study design is actually one that we can't physically do. Um, so it involves, you know, giving an individual drug A, following them for a period of time, seeing if they develop the outcome of interest, put that person in a time machine, go back to that moment that you gave them drug A, give them drug B, follow them for a period of time, see if they develop the outcome of interest, and any difference in the occurrence of the outcome is due to the exposure because everything else is held constant, including time. So here, with my hypothetical drug interaction study, I was able to kind of emulate the counterfactual here. So, you know, we took the patient's medication list, exposed it to sofosbuvir, determined whether or not the, whether or not a contraindicated interaction existed, replaced that exposure with semeprevir. Um, and determined if a contraindicated interaction existed. And I think this is probably like the one living example of the, the counterfactual, but um, what we found was there was a significant difference in the frequency of interactions between um, semeprevir and sofosbuvir containing regimens, um, at least in, in a co-infected population. 
but we know the co-infected population makes a very small proportion of the overall hepatitis C population. So I replicated the study in patients who uh, were mono-infected, so I, I tortured a lot of pharmacy students to collect over 4,000 medication profiles of hep C mono-infected patients and run them through these interaction checkers. And we observed a similar, similar finding, which was um, there's a higher frequency of interactions with semeprovir versus cefospivir, although the absolute difference wasn't as um, dramatic. And that, that kind of parlayed me into you know, subsequent work. Um, Gilead, the, the, guideline, the Hep C guidelines changed once again, and I was able to get two companion grants from Gilead to look at contemporary Hep C regimens um, uh, in mono-infected patients, and then again in co-infected patients. So um, we presented, or we published this data in Annals of Hepatology and essentially found that uh, Gleepib had the highest frequency of interactions, and Softvel and uh, uh, Grozoprevir and Elbasvir had the lowest frequency of interactions. And I've presented some of this data at EASL, and I'll present the remainder of this data um, at ECMID next April. So I hope that gives you a little glimpse of just the ability to, you know, keep, you know, work with very little and try to turn those chicken toenails into chicken soup or chicken cordon bleu, whatever you prefer. Um, so I, uh, after ID week in San Francisco in 2018, I hopped on a flight and started my, my life in San Diego. And anyone who's left one academic job for another academic job and has this foolish thought that you can just leave with a clean slate and start a new job with a blank canvas, you are fooling yourself. <laughs> Um, so I ended up bringing a lot of uh, my, my, my grants with me. Um, so these are the things that I've been trying to blow through in the last year. So a fluoroquinolone study, a C. difficile study, um, a burden of illness study in skin populations that are hospitalized, a Vanco, uh, and I think one of the things when people hear a a a vancomycin is, oh, not another Vanco AKI study. Um, but we know that vancomycin is associated with AKI, and when that AKI resolves and that patient is discharged, and they come back to the hospital in a year from now, and they need gram-positive coverage, can you safely administer vancomycin to them again? Um, and is the exposure threshold associated with AKI that second time around, is it higher or lower? Um, do the, is there a little bit of muscle memory from that first AKI ep episode? And then um, probably a couple of studies that are more, yes. <coughs> Just a comment on that. Um, when it seems like when someone has AKI that they think is secondary to vancomycin, oftentimes it's hard to prove because yeah. they're on other antibiotics, other things going on. It seems here that it ends up in an aller in the allergy section, and it's certainly not an allergy unless it is truly, um, you know, an allergic reaction, which we can't prove or oftentimes can't prove, but then it seems to hang there. And I'd be really interested in this because we say, oh, this person can't ever get vancomycin, at least in, it seems like this happens at UCSD, that it hangs out there and says they have this terrible reaction to it, so never give it to them again. Um, and, I, and I don't know if we know that we can or cannot if they have that kind of response. Well, I'll, 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 give, you, I'll give you a little snapshot of what I found. Um, so the AKI threshold in that initial bout is roughly driven by an AUC above 650. And you know that's you know well above the therapeutic range. You need to be have an AUC of 400 or higher. Um, but that second time around, what we found is the AKI threshold associated with a, an AKI episode falls down to 400, which is like the basement of where the, the threshold is. So I mean, we're at a point where we have a lot of gram-positive gram agents. Um, why we have this love affair with Banco, I don't know. I know that it's cheap. and yeah, so, and then, a couple of, and then a couple of projects that are probably pertinent to this group, um, the sociodemographic characteristics of bareback and swingers at risk of STIs. I probably should come up with like a more dinner table appropriate title for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my parents are gonna listen to this talk. <laughs> and then um, looking at ART adherence thresholds. Um, so we, we have different studies that look at different ART adherence thresholds associated with outcomes. But in HIV, I think of three different outcomes. I think of detectable viral loads getting to undetectable. So I think there's one adherence threshold associated with that. Once you're undetectable, staying undetectable, I think there's an, another adherence threshold associated with that. 
and then pre preventing the emergence of resistance. So I think there's a third uh, adherence threshold. And it would be nice to have one comprehensive paper that has all three of those thresholds defined in the same population. And so that's some of the data that I'm, I'm burning through right now. But I wanted to spend more of the presentation talking about some of my uh, UCSD derived projects. And there's three of them that I'll talk about. Um, so I'll talk about um, my NOCO grant modeling the micro elimination of hep C in veterans who are co-infected with HIV. And Jill was fortunate enough to be a NOCO recipient in 2017. No? No? Oh, I thought you had, I had a NOCO. I'm sorry. OK, I guess Jill doesn't have a NOCO. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so um, I, I, uh, I applied for this NOCO grant um, within the first month of, of working at UCSD last year. And one of the things that I didn't have a good appreciation for is how long contracting takes here. So I just signed the contract for this yesterday. <laughs> um, but it's a big data project. And for those of you who have any experience with the VA, the VA has been very protective of um, who can access that national data. And in the last couple of years, they've loosened the noose just a little bit and given some people access to that national data. And my co-PI, um, Nick Britt and I, have been able to access the national cohort of data um, within the VA, at least in the enterococcus space, and had a fair amount of success there. Um, but we thought this is something that we could very easily do in the HIV co-infected space. So that's why we applied for this NOCO grant. And we felt that it was meaningful because the VA, they're the largest provider of hep C care in the country. And since the availability of DAAs, over 100,000 people have been treated, um, which is quite impressive. Um, you think about a lot of states that have these arbitrary restrictions on who can get hep C therapy and who can't get hep C therapy. The VA, you know, and I never talk about the VA being miraculous, but miraculously, they have lifted a lot of those traditional barriers that some of the states are, are in legal battles trying to fight. But despite removal of those traditional barriers, um, over 26,000, at least as of July, uh, veterans still have uh, hepatitis C. And of, of that 26,000, we anticipate that 15,000 are co-infected with HIV as well. Um, so I, I think going from over 100,000 individuals with hepatitis C to you know, 26,000, I think there's a very realistic opportunity to get down to zero. Um, so that's kind of what this project is all about. Um, it's a retrospective cohort study among veterans with co-infection um, in the DAA era, and we're going to link up the national hep C registry with the national HIV registry and cross list those two registries to identify our cohort. And we're going to work with Adil Butt in um, Pittsburgh, who oversees the archives data, which is looking at hep C in the mono-infected population. Um, but uh, we're focused on the co-infected population. But we have four aims. And the four aims of the study are to understand, of those people who are treated and of those people who are remaining to be treated, what makes them different? Um, are there modifiable factors between those two populations? And can we intervene on those modifiable factors? Um, we also have a hypothesis that getting people treated for hep C will improve their HIV cascade of care. So maybe those people who are intermittently retained in care will be more consistently retained in care. Um, perhaps those people who are inconsistently on ART will make the decision to be more consistently on ART and hopefully um, we can impact the proportion of individuals who are virologically suppressed because we know as we reduce that community viral load, we also reduce the probability of transmission to uninfected individuals. Um, the third one, and I, I kind of cringe when I hear clinicians talk about not wanting to treat um, an, an active drug user for hepatitis C, um, is looking at reinfection. And I don't think we have good numbers of reinfection um, within the VA. So we want to quantify how often is this occurring and are there predictors of reinfection that are, are happening? Um, and the fourth, and <laughs> don't get overwhelmed by the picture, but um, there's a lot of stuff going on. Just listen to the words. Don't look at the picture. <laughs> um, so uh, the picture is an oversimplified model, but we took, we adopted the methodology from oncology. So in oncology, you have mathematical modelers who can take a tumor, and if you give 
you know, X rounds of chemo, Y amount of radiation, and Z amount of um, surgical resection, you can model when that tumor will shrink down to zero. What we want to do is we want to model the number of annual cycles it takes to get this population of 15,000 co-infected veterans down to zero. And our points of intervention are, our a priori points of intervention are early treatment versus delayed treatment. I think the timing of treatment relative to diagnosis is important. Removing those priority barriers between cirrhotics and non-cirrhotic patients. Uh, increasing uh, the proportion utilizing mental health and behavioral health services. And then expanding the provider pool. Um, so historically, Hep C has traditionally been treated mostly by ID or GI. Um, if we if we train the the physicians out in the C box, so the decentralized primary care clinics, um, to deal with hepatitis C, could we get to zero faster? And also operationalizing our mid-level practitioners. And I was certainly a product of this. Um, uh, expanding the pool from just MDs treating to mid levels and allied health professionals like myself. And then uh, the other the other big project that I worked on was with Dr. Morris, uh, and this was a grant submission to the California HIV Research Program, looking at the renal effects of hormones and biomarkers in the trans population. Um, so we know that the trans population is highly is at high risk for HIV, and they're a population that would benefit from uh, PrEP. Right now, we have two commercially available options for PrEP, which is, which is wonderful. We have FTDF and FTAF. Um, both of these medications are cleared by the kidneys, and the dosing, dosing of these medications relies on accurate estimation of renal function. We have a lot of renal biomarkers. Some are functional, some are associated with inflammation. But the one that we historically have used is creatinine, um, even though cystatin C is probably a more specific marker of um, kidney function. Um, but the most prevalent method of calculating uh, re or estimating renal function is to calculate creatinine clearance using an equation from 1978. Um, it's a problem because when you look at the inputs of this equation, um, serum creatinine, so in the transgender population, it's a population that is using a high amount and high doses of hormones. Um, and we know that hormones can affect renal blood flow and creatinine. Um, hormones can also affect muscle mass and in turn body weight. And creatinine is a, a, break, is a byproduct of muscle breakdown, so it can also affect serum creatinine. And then the original equation had this 0.85 multiplier if you were a female. So presumably this was based on sex assigned at birth, but for the transgender population, it's unclear what that multiplier should be. So our study has three aims. Um, the first aim is to look at exogenous um, use of hormones, um, which is one way of measuring drug exposure. Um, the in vivo measurement of hormone levels, renal biomarkers, and renal function. So we know that this equation is broken. Um, so what we want to do is we want to calculate renal function using the gold standard, which is iohexol clearance. Um, and we want to do a log linear model. So um, I, the best way to describe a log linear model is to think of a fish tank. And if you were to drop 100 magnets into a fish tank, those 100 magnets are not going to stick together. They're, they're going to cluster together in different formations. And we want, what we want to see is the interrelatedness of exogenous hormone use, in vivo hormonal measures, renal biomarkers, and um, renal function based on the gold standard of measuring renal function. Our second aim, because we recognize that this equation is broken, can we just figure out a new multiplier and would that solve, solve everyone's problems? Or do we have to create a new equation altogether? And then the third, the third aim has to do with um, drug exposure. So how do hormones and renal biomarkers affect um, FTAF and FTDF concentrations? So it's a tandem cross-sectional study um, performed once while the patients are on FTDF and again after they switch over to FTAF. And we want to leverage uh, participants in the 603 study, which from my understanding is a study of adherence and motivational interviewing, um, and many of whom are expected to switch over from FTDF to FTAF potentially. Um, 
So the inclusion criteria, the receipt of uh, Truvada for at least 12 weeks and anticipate switching over to FTAF within three months. And during each study visit, um, they just have to be willing to take a very, very low dose of Iohexol, um, provide one urine, four bloods, and one dried blood spot card, and spend three hours at the AVRC with me. <laughs> Um, and the exclusions are fairly straightforward. If you're allergic to IOHexol, you probably shouldn't receive IOHexol. If you are using medications that interfere with IOHexol, primarily metformin, um, it, it probably won't help us with the data that we're trying to ascertain. And because we need a urine sample, we need people to be able to produce 30 mLs. Um, so the desired enrollment, we're hoping for 40 patients, and among those assigned male at birth, we're hoping to get 10 who are on hormones and 10 who are not on hormones. And among those who are assigned female at birth, we're hoping to get 10 who are on hormones and 10 who are off or not on hormones. Um, so this is kind of the, 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 the the, the procedures here. So I know that there's more than four X's, but a lot of these are batched labs. So it's just four tubes of blood, um, one dried blood spot card, and one urine sample. But I think this has profound impacts for the, the trans community, not only for PrEP and the decision to initiate PrEP, but also the safety and monitoring of PrEP, um, because you know we know that Truvada and Discovy can affect renal function. But if we can figure out a way to better estimate renal function in the trans population, I think this has far-reaching implications um, that extend beyond just HIV prevention. I think this will affect renal dosing of medications that, you know, renal dosing of antibiotics, renal dosing of, you know, blood pressure medications, diabetes medications. So I think there's a, a lot of far-reaching implications of this. And the last uh, project I'll talk about is one that I did with Jill and we submitted this last week. So we're awaiting funding. So I don't want to, I don't want to say too much because <laughs> I feel like that's a, a curse to do that. Um, but one of the things that is very clear is that PrEP uptake in the transgender population is fairly low and certainly can be improved. And I think one of the reasons, and there, you know, there's everything in life is multifactorial, but I think one of the reasons for this might be a perceived interaction between um, uh, their their horm hormone use and um, prep and you know within the literature it seems though um, the the trans population will prioritize adherence to their hormones over medications used for you're you're nodding okay I'm speaking your language <laughs> um, it seems like they may prioritize the use of hormones over medications used for chronic health conditions. Um, so the IFAC study was a study that assessed uh, transgender women on Truvada and on feminizing hormone therapy. And what, what was found in that study was, despite perfect adherence, so we rarely see perfect adherence, despite perfect adherence, tenofovir exposure was reduced by 13%. We know that there's, a th we know that there's an exposure threshold associated with a protective effect. So in the context of real world settings where people may not, be, may not have perfect adherence, this could be problematic. Um, so I think the study needs to be replicated in, uh, in individuals who are using FTAF. Uh, so that's what the premise of our grant proposal was. And then, you know, just because, you know, while we're at it, why don't we get some more, get some more data? Um, one, of the, one of the issues certainly is how do you measure adherence and one tool to measure at least recent adherence is uh, urine tenofovir. Um, so it's unclear how hormones affect urine tenofovir, if at all. Um, but more, more importantly, um, all of the urine tenofovir studies have been done in individuals who are on FTDF rather than FTAF. So um, I think it's an important thing to look at. So our aims are fairly straightforward. We want to determine the effect of hormones on tenofovir. We want to assess the effect of tenofovir on hormones. And then third, we want to assess uh, urine tenofovir levels in um, a group of patients who are likely to switch over to uh, TAF from FTDF. Um, so that's kind of what Jill and I are hoping will get funded and we're keeping our fingers crossed, but Jill also submitted a, a second grant at the same time. So our companion grants went in together and hopefully one of them gets funded, um, if not both. But um, you know, I think that's kind of all I had today, but I hope I gave you a glimpse of who I am and my hustle and uh, 
my ability to turn chicken toenails into chicken soup. <laughs> so I'll take any questions if there's time.